الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين Last time <coughs> and this time we are going to continue to cover what the Quran says about people and what the Quran says to people. Today we are going to explore not people in general, but a specific community, the community of Moses alayhi salam. This community has really made history in terms of the expansion of the text of the Quran addressing their stories. The story of Musa and Pharaoh, the story of Musa and the children of Israel, and all what they have gone through of difficulties and struggle, and also what they have responded with to the challenges of their time, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept saving them time after time after time. Being the significant community in the history of religious studies, the children of Israel must become of interest to every Muslim. After all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses their community as a backdrop and admonishment because of their practice and their history to our community. So they become the preceding communities. Those are the people that Allah refers to as min qabl the communities that came before you. So we need to study their history. We need to know who they are, where they come from, what do they do, and what have they been doing. Especially whatever the Quran tells us, we have to take it and study it, and then we can expand on this if needed. But I believe what the Quran gave us is more than enough. It's more than enough because it addresses them not only as people, but as a special type of community. They are called by the name of their father. Everybody else is called the Bani Adam, right? They are called Bani Israel. That must be significant, okay? And there is a difference between Bani Israel, the historical community of the children of Prophet Yaqub, whose name is also Israel, and the current Jewish community as we know it. These are not one and the same. So when you say the word Al-Yahud, it is not equal to Bani Israel. When you say Bani Israel, it is not equal to Al-Yahud as we know them today. So we have to differentiate. The children of Israel were 12. And Israel is Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam. Israel means Abdullah. It is a Jewish or Hebrew name for Abdullah. That's what the name, where the name comes from. And the children of Prophet Yaqub, who are the children of Israel, they were 12, they turned into 12 tribes, and they extended throughout the history of the children of Israel, and later on evolved into the Jewish people, as the names will signify certain different things between ethnicity, religious belief, faith, practice, tradition, references, all of these issues will come to play a role in defining who is a Jew, who is a child of Israel. When you talk about children of Israel, you're talking about the traditional community of the children of Prophet Yaqub and their descendants. So if a Jewish person comes into the Jewish faith because his mother is or his father is, that does not make them 
from the descendants of Yaqub. And this has to be a significant issue. Also, while we'll add it uh, uh, with the name, I want to uh, let everybody know that it, it has been very smart for the Jews of today to call the state they occupied Israel. It's giving it a name that is significant and important and honored by Muslims. So now, if you speak against Israel, the state, they construe it as you're talking against Yaqub and his children and against your own book. But we have to understand what we're dealing with. We're dealing with manipulation as well. I hope somebody doesn't call me anti-Semitic because I am more Semitic than those who claim to be Semitic. But it doesn't matter to me. So, ayah number 40 starts us off with the children of Israel. O children of Israel, remember my favor which I bestowed upon you. Udkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. Being children of Israel signifies a specific community with certain characteristics that we will get to know in few ayat, but not, now, not today, but maybe inshallah next week. So, when Allah calls them children of Israel, it is similar to Allah calling them and the Christians people of the book. It doesn't mean that anyone who claims to be a Jew is addressed here. But if they claim to be followers of Yaqub and as such legitimate children of his, it doesn't mean they are uh, genetically his children or descendants. But the Quran addresses those who claim it and those who truly are uh, children of Israel. So, Ya Bani Israel, Uzkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. And then what? Wa awfu bi'ahdi. Fulfill the covenant that you have given me. And then, Ufi bi'ahdikum. I fulfilled the covenant you took from me or I conferred upon you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the only one who can oblige Himself, but no one could oblige Allah. But Allah will always fulfill whatever obligation He takes upon Himself. For example, Allah says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. His ijaba, nobody is forcing it on him. He is conferring it upon those who make dua. So the point here is that it is not an agreement or a covenant between two equals. When Allah commits, it's a blessing. When we commit, it is an obligation. This is a huge difference here. So, وَأَوْفُوا بِعَهْدِي أُوفِي بِعَهْدِكُمْ وَإِيَّايَ فَرْهَبُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah is relating to us as he had a relationship, a covenant with the children of Israel. That covenant is not different in any much way than the covenant he has taken from the children of Adam in general. What is the covenant? We'll get to know the details of the covenant. But here is the introduction. So this is the preface that I expect you to fulfill your commitment to the covenant that you have given me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in more than one place, وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ We have taken their covenant. They made a commitment to live up to it, and that is what the covenant is about. Which I bestowed upon you and fulfill my covenant, I took from you, and I fulfill the covenant or your covenant I conferred upon you. But fear none but me. So, this commitment means that the children of Israel should not worry about anything but their relationship with Allah. They should not give any commitment to any body, group, or individuals that would violate their commitment to Allah and they should fulfill the whole commitment, not just part of it. So let us see what the commitment 
is the commitment is wa aminu bima anzaltu musaddiqan lima ma'akum so what is the general commitment the general commitment is ya bani israel a'budu allah rabbi wa rabbakum wa idh akhadna mithaq bani israel alla ta'budu illa allah wa bil walidayn ihsan this is again coming in uh, surah al-baqarah as well so this is the covenant, the general covenant, to worship none but Allah, to take Allah for their Lord, and to commit to be his servants. Like their great-grandfather Yaqub was committed, they need to be equally committed. وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ The Quran here is referring to something that came after their book that is confirming their book, مُصَدِّقًا Lima Ma'akum. The Quran is referring here to what? To the Quran. The Quran is referring to the Quran as the book that came after the Torah and after the Injil. When it says Musaddiqan, which means confirming, it is giving them tools and it's giving us Muslims tools to look for what is in the Quran that is confirming the books that came before. So that when we discuss, at least we are aware of what the Quran is referring to. Where is the tasdiq? Your book says that Isa uh, is uh, a prophet, but our book, the Torah, doesn't recognize him. So where does it become confirming? Well, fine. If the two books do not agree, it means one of three things. It's either an issue that the Quran did not consider relevant and it doesn't affect anything, or like for example, names of prophets. Some prophets were mentioned by name in the Quran, some were not. So nobody could come and tell me, you told us your book confirms my book. So Matthew, Mark and Luke are prophets, right? I say, no, they are not. They say, they are my book. Not necessarily. So, where do we stand as Muslims in terms of what is different between the Quran and the previous two major books that came before? The difference is, or the, the, the way to deal with this is, we believe in anything in the Torah or the Injil that is consistent with the Quran. Okay, what about if it is not? If it is not, it is one of two things. Either that the Quran is silent on the issue, like the names of prophets, or sometimes names of villages or communities or places. That's okay. They have names and places and uh, community names and history. That is their issue. And with this kind of thing, we neither believe it in the specifics nor do we deny it because it's not in our book. So when somebody says, is Daniel a prophet? I say, in your book he is. What about in your book? He's not mentioned in my book. So you don't believe in Daniel? I said, my book didn't mention it. And as such, it is an issue that I am not making a judgment. So we don't make judgment on issues that the Quran is silent about while their books mention it. What about things that they mention and they are contrary to the Quran? Like stories about Prophet Nuh and stories about other prophets that are inconsistent with our faith and our belief and what we have in the Quran. Those stories ought to be rejected. The parts that are opposite and contrary to what is in the Quran we don't take it because it's contrary to the Quran. If you say, I believe in the Quran, and somebody says, and I believe something different, that's their right, right? And we don't have to coerce anybody to change, but they should not impose on us something that is not in our faith. So our position where the Quran is silent is for us to be silent. We have no judgment. Where the Quran has a statement and they have an opposing statement, we reject it. We don't believe in it. And it's not true. So, on terms of what is musaddiqan and what is not, the onus is on us
to get the information out. Then the responsibility is on them to confirm it or not to confirm it with what they have in their book. But th the subject is more involved than this, but I'm giving you the shell so that the issue is at least somewhat clear. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَ كَافِرٍ بِهِ Don't be the first community to reject what Allah has revealed after your book because you are establishing a precedent. Because all throughout history, all other prophets that came, they went through the Israelite chain of prophets. Right? From Yaqub down the chain, all of them were Israelite prophets, according to the Quran. Those who came before that, they were children of Nuh and uh, Idris and Sheath, children of Adam salam. So if they reject Prophet Muhammad, it will not be the first one they had rejected. So they cannot say, we reject him because he is not a Jew. But that's what they said anyway. But they cannot do that. Why can't they do that? Because they rejected Jewish prophets as well. So they cannot use ethnicity or Jewishness or being Israelite as a reason to reject the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, two major reasons prompted the commission of the Prophet ﷺ. And we Muslims need to really wrap our head around these two issues. Number one is the response of the children of Israel to four previous prophets. What was the response? The Quran summarizes it. أَفَكُلَّمَا جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهْوَى أَنفُسُكُمْ اسْتَكْبَرْتُمْ فَفَرِيقًا كَذَّبْتُمْ وَفَرِيقًا تَقْتُلُونَ Isn't it true that whenever a messenger comes to you with something you don't like, you either kill or you killed some and you belied some. You rejected some and you killed some. Right? So they killed Prophet Zakaria, named Zachariah in their book. They killed his son Yahya, John the Baptist, in their book. They killed Elias, the same name, in their book. Three of them consecutively and concurrently, right before Isa alayhi salam. So those three were finished. What was the claim? They said, it is in our book that if anyone claims to be a prophet and he does not prove it, we will kill him. So they seem to be consistent with the law. But who decided that he is not a prophet? It is them. So they are saying, if anyone comes with a message that we reject, we will kill him. So they get rid of the Prophet and the message and it's finished. So they did this and Isa alayhi salam was saying that they were going to try to kill him as they did to Elias. Amazing prophecy. And it happened. They delivered him to be crucified. So after killing four prophets in a row, Jesus was an attempt it was not fulfilled according to the Quran, but they take pride in it anyway. They say, So they still take pride that they are a community of zealotry and uh, commitment and they are willing to go all the way to do anything. And they prove that their history is like that. So they kill these three prophets. They try to kill the fourth, which, which is Isa alayhi salam, unsuccessfully. Then, what sense does it make, right? If you have marketers in your company, and you send those people to do marketing for your company in three villages, right? And whenever you send someone to one village in particular, they are either refused, beaten, or killed. Would you send the fourth one in the same village? If we could make this conclusion that easy, why should it be difficult 
for Allah to make the same determination. He sent this community about 25,000 prophets throughout their history. And their response was quite miserable, including the response to Moses himself. And he complained to God. He said, according to them, according to their book, Oh God, take me away from these people. I don't want to be with them. And Allah told him, be patient. And Moses, alayhi salam, was very, very patient. Formidable patient, alayhi salam. So, this is one great reason that Allah would shift the messengership from this Israelite community altogether to another community that is far away from their realm so that they can deliver the message or he can deliver the message peacefully and safely. But they never left it alone. So sending a prophet from outside the Jewish community was also prophesied by Isa alayhi salam. Isa himself, he said, what do you think of an owner of a vineyard when he sends his workers to collect the harvest and the farmers would beat his workers and kill them? Then he said, I would send my personal representative. I will send my son. So they also kill his son. What do you think he will do? And they all said, the normal answer that you have, he will go himself and take care of his business. So he, Isa, continues and says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who would produce the fruits of it. The kingdom of God means the messengership. A risala will be taken away from you because you are reacting miserably. You're not receiving prophets well. You're not even letting them have a day with the people. You cut them off. You kill them. So Allah, in his divine wisdom, has given Jesus السلام, the, the, the pre-warning to tell them, if you don't straighten up your act, if you do something to me, and I am the last one before the last. He is the last before the last. But he is the last in the children of Israel. So I told him, I'm your last chance. If you want a prophet, stick it with me and be careful what to do. So this is one big reason that what happened to these four prophets, besides many other prophets before, that we don't know the details of what was done to them. Okay. The second reason the mission of prophethood was moved from the Jewish community and the children of Israel is because of another thing, very obvious. And the Quran makes no bone about it. It speaks about it very frankly, which is alteration of the books. So the prophets are killed and the books are altered. So how could Allah entrust them with the next book? So not only the prophet will have to go or come from another community, but the next revelation definitely has to go with him. So what does Allah do about the potential that the following community would not do what the previous community did? In terms of the protection of the Prophet وسلم, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas Amazing. Allah will secure you from people. Which means, it doesn't mean that they will never hurt you. It means they will never be able to stop you from delivering the message. They cannot finish you off if they want. They cannot kill you. They cannot stop you. Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas So the ayah is, Ya ayyuha rasulu ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتَهُ وَاللَّهُ يَعْصِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ So it is Isma related to conveying the message. So this protection, insurance for his life and for the completeness of the message is coming from Allah 
to ensure that the message is fully delivered. What does this treat? It treats the potential of his killing prematurely, right? So he died only after the message was completed. So what does Allah do about the books that were entrusted into their hand and then they squandered it? It was entrusted into the hand to write what Musa said, what Jesus said, but they did not do it even during their life altogether. And Allah keeps sending them reminders. And what happens? فَنَسُوا حَظًّا مِمَّا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ Whenever Allah brings them a reminder, a new prophet, a new book, they just neglect it. Nasu here doesn't mean that they forgot it. Because Allah forgives our forgetfulness. But here, forgot doesn't mean forgot. It means neglected. Nasu means neglected. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also protected the book. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ We have sent down the revelation, the reminder, and we, it is on us to keep it. It is we who are going to keep it. So who is going to play with the Qur'an? 1400 years, everybody who doesn't like the Qur'an tried to have their own copy, manipulating it, changing places of ayat or words in the surah, and everything has been tried. But we know that Allah has protected the Qur'an, as He has protected the Prophet Say Alhamdulillah. Previous communities were not as favored as this community, even though we, will, we read here in the ayah, Huh? No, we'll read it. That I have favored you all over the world. Up until their time. And Faddal Tukum doesn't mean preferred you. It means I have favored you. I have bestowed more bounties on you than all others. Previous communities they get one prophet, one chance, light, and they lived long. So that one chance was long enough for them to recover from heathen and uh, uh, kufr practices. But when they refused, Allah would save the believers and crush all the rest. That happened in previous communities. But from Yaqub down, the punishment was not to finish this community. Apparently, the Quran says they will be living until the day of judgment, no matter how few they may be. And that's a test for them and for the rest of humanity to try to recover them from the falling all the way, every generation on the same path. Our responsibility is to do da'wah. Our responsibility is to reach out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them all of these opportunities our Ummah has one messenger and the Prophet وسلم, out of mercy and love and care he asked Allah not to wipe this community as he wiped others before. So Allah gave him what he asked for. On this account Allah promised that he will not wipe this Ummah. It will survive until the day of judgment, and those who do good will be rewarded, and those who do bad, they will be punished. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيِّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجِزَ بِهِ وَلَا يَجِدْ لَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نَصِيرًا So, our ummah will live, physically speaking, but what kind of life? It depends on the person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a Muslim life. اللهم لا توفنا إلا وأنت راض عنا. So وأمنوا بما أنزلت مصدقا لما معكم ولا تكونوا أول كافر به ولا تشتروا بآياتي ثمنا قليلا. Don't sell off my ayat for a small price. 
And any price is a small price. Any price is a small price because the words of Allah are invaluable. You can't put a price on it. So anyone who trades off the words of Allah for his opinion or for a constitution or for any document, they are making the worst trade off. It is like giving your most valuable thing in your life for little than dust. Nobody in their right mind would do this. Do we Muslims follow some of the footsteps of the people of the book? Are we trading off our deen for little price? Do we believe in what Allah has sent down to us so much that we practice it, we love it, we appreciate it? Do we believe that the Quran is the source and the reference for our life? Do we treat it like that? Or are we going to do what Allah warned us not to do? وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Have we fallen into this harsh-heartedness? Because we've been Muslims 14 years, generation after generation, until Islam has become a culture to be inherited, not a faith to be practiced and believed. This has to be reviewed, otherwise we fall into the, the hole that Allah warned us not to fall in. We fall in the same hole. So our judgment regarding the people of the book, whether Christians or Jews, should not be my opinion or your opinion. We should accept the judgment of Allah and we should leave it for Him to make the judgment. But we should study their history as the Quran tells us so that we do not fall where they fell. This is the challenge that our Ummah has and it has had it for a long time. We need a generation that is different from the adult generation every time there is a new generation. So we need to teach our children at least they, they sh should be better than us. Let them criticize us all they, they can. But they should, before they open their mouth, they should do better so that they and their children can become a little bit more effective and better than we are. This is a challenge. The other challenge is that we set some models in our generation that can help the following generation pick up from a good place and instead of picking up only the miseries that we leave them in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to be true and full-time Muslims. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa ba'd As our ummah is facing tremendous challenges almost everywhere there is a Muslim from Indonesia to Myanmar to uh, Bangladesh to Pakistan to uh, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, all of the rest of it from the east to the west, from the north to the south, all the way to the west where we live. I am reminded of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the children of Israel. Why did he put them through difficult times? Why did he put them through challenges that were very difficult for them? Why did he put them through a lot of tests and difficult challenges? He says, فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَضَرَّعُونَ The purpose of challenges is to humble us and to bring us on our knees and on our heads on the floor to come in humility and submission to Allah. The purpose is not to torture us. The purpose is not to torment us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very clearly, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ 
إن شكرتم وآمنتم What would Allah do with your torment or torture or any difficulty that you face? Afflictions, mayhem, poverty, sickness, disease, wars, killing. What would Allah do with all of this? What does it mean for him? Nothing. It means nothing. It benefits him in no way. Right? إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَى آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبُوا The more Allah gives us, the more we produce tyrants, pharaohs, oppressive regimes and people. People who have no mercy in their heart, no consideration for the poor, the underprivileged, the weak, the handicapped, the orphan, the women. Why? Why are we working against ourselves when it comes to our relationship with Allah? إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ Our Ummah needs to hear this all the time. If you do well, you do well for your own sake, for your own soul, for your own salvation. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا And if you do bad, it is on yourself, it is against yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to become better Muslims. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين اللهم لا توفنا إلا وأنت راض عنا اللهم لا توفنا إلا وأنت راض عنا اللهم ارضنا وارض عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا وآتنا ولا تحرمنا أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاه